Okay, we are live. Hey! Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is London. Calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Rick Byer, Chris. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Week 24, and you're still working <laughs> on my name. Wait till we I get know. to our guest today. We'll see how you do on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got the cliff notes. <laughs> well, well, we'll wait a moment for people to join us, and we'll ask people as they uh, come on to sign in or say hi or... Uh, whatever so that we can see that you're there and uh, tell us where you're from whether it's uh, Duncan in Holland or Kathy in Rhode Island uh, and a reminder that this is History Happy Hour in case you forgot where you were going uh, and we're here every Sunday getting happy with history at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours webpage uh, and YouTube page and all of our broadcasts are also form uh, archived speaking not working for me today. Uh, <laughs> and you were mocking me. On the hist- I, any chance I get, Chris. <laughs> on the History Happy Hour webpage. Chris, do you think that people will notice something different about us today? Uh, well, let's see. Let's ask our audience. Do they notice anything different? Do you notice anything different about us today? And, um, yeah, well, we'll give them a moment. We'll say mm-hmm. hi to Tom and Ted and uh, Nancy, who's asking if Doreen is there. I, I love everybody wants to make sure everybody else is there for their history happy hour fix. And Jim Latin. So what Jim Latin does, uh, Chris, is he watches history happy hour on Zoom with his friend Mark Lewis. So they're on a separate Zoom watching together so they can oh. talk about it offline. Good deal. Crazy. So, yes, uh, we are wearing headphones. Uh, we are trying an experiment today to uh, see if the audio can be a little better. We just thought we would uh, kind of mix it up a little bit. You let us know if you think we look too geeky. I think mean, we look pretty geeky to begin with, so if this is a problem, yeah, I'm really. sure folks will let us know. I think we've reached enough of a critical mass, Chris, that we can play the world-famous <laughs> History Happy Hour open. Brrr, bang! <laughs> And here we are. The bar, the bar is, is open. open. And Chris, you want to introduce our guest and our topic today? Yeah, um, I'm really excited and happy to have uh, Jerry Prokopovich. Yeah. Jerry, I'm sorry, I practiced your name and everything. But uh, Jerry is uh, the chair of history at uh, East Carolina University. And prior to that, he served for nine years as the resident scholar at the Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So he knows a little bit about Lincoln. Uh, he's the author of All for the Regiment and Did Lincoln Own Slaves, among other topics. He's also uh, the host of a Civil War uh, podcast, which is uh, very, very good. Civil um, War Talk Radio, it's called, isn't Civil it? Civil War Talk Radio, yes. Right. Excuse me. Um, but uh, the reason we have Jerry on is he, he leads a number of the uh, Civil War tours for Ambrose, but more importantly, uh, he's, a, he's a Lincoln expert. And we've Rick and I have talked quite a bit about how we feel that we haven't talked enough about the American Civil War, so we're going to go to the source, uh, and Jerry is going to talk to us about uh, Lincoln, and specifically Lincoln as a military leader. And so, um, Rick, do you want to kind of get us started on that? Absolutely. Um, uh, Jerry, first of all, uh, I want to just ask, uh, since, you know, it is History Happy Hour. Oh, yeah. Did you bring a cocktail? I did indeed. I have uh, Knob Creek uh, bourbon. From, Show us the bottle there. Okay. It's from, from Lincoln's own neighborhood in Kentucky. Uh, he himself did not drink. He, he said the taste of whiskey left him feeling flabby and undone. Mm. But my goal is, in fact, to feel flabby and undone. So <laughs> exactly. I'm happy to go ahead and I, I love flabby and undone. Those are definite <laughs> things that I'm me. that I'm aiming at. Um, so uh, as the Civil War begins, uh, you have um, uh, two presidents, Abraham Lincoln uh, and Jefferson Davis. And on paper, uh, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, is by far the more uh, uh, prepared to be commander in chief. He was a West Point graduate. He served distinction in the Mexican War. He was Secretary of War under Franklin Pierce. Uh, Lincoln served 
a couple of months in the militia in the Black Hawk War, never saw action, and said his biggest enemy, I think, was the mosquitoes. So did that put Lincoln at a disadvantage in any way? And uh, as a collateral question to that, I will ask, did, uh, did uh, Davis's experiences help or, or hurt him as president of the Confederacy? Well, there, there's no question that Lincoln certainly comes into office in 1861 seeming unprepared uh, and comparatively inexperienced uh, next to Jefferson Davis. Uh, the question of how much the military expertise or experience of soldiers in the mid-19th century relates to the American Civil War, however, is certainly questionable because no American officer had commanded uh, anything larger than and what would be a strong brigade, uh, maybe a division. Uh, so you, the experience that people brought into the war would largely be challenged and tested. So it's not entirely clear that having no experience was uh, was such a strong negative. We'll okay. see how Lincoln evolved over time uh, uh, to, to make that inexperience into a useful uh, attribute. Okay. Um, and I want to remind people that we would love to, to hear your questions coming in uh, as well as, um, uh, as we do this. And Jerry, I'm hearing from a couple of people that your volume is a little low, so I don't know if you want to adjust your mic where it is where, near your mouth or, or talk louder, but whatever you can do there to, to give us a hand on that would be, would be helpful. Okay. I don't have a... I, I can't change the microphone itself as far as I can tell, but I but will you try already, to speak up. And, you are already better. Okay. So I'll, you are I'll already better. Uh, Chris, you want me to keep going or you want to well, jump no, I in? Just, one of the kind of along the lines of what Rick is saying is, you know, uh, Lincoln becomes president. Um, he's now the commander in chief. Uh, but there's very little in the Constitution that says what that means. I mean, the Constitution says you will command the army and navy, you will command the militia, but it that's it. I mean, there's no, and this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. Um, uh, and so, first of all, does, does how does he take that? And, and is he the person that actually defines what the commander-in-chief is? Well, it, it, certainly he has that opportunity. I mean, no, no, as you say, Chris, nobody knows what's going on at the, the start of the, the war. No one's sure what the authority is both uh, Davis initially at, at first Manassas and Lincoln later at several times uh, through the war considers the idea of actually taking command of military forces of actually going out into the field uh, because commander-in-chief theoretically could do that it might not be a good idea but as you say there's nothing in the Constitution to prevent it so everything is an improvisation for both sides from the start of the war. That was one of the reasons I initially, I wrote my dissertation and first book on the Army of the Ohio in 1861-62, partly because the question that fascinated me was how do you go from having a country with no military to speak of 16,000 right. soldiers in the regular army scattered in constabulary posts across the West, no, no serious major military force to speak of and a year later you've got armies of a hundred thousand that's an amazing institution to create out of nothing and the same applies to lincoln uh how do you take the office of the presidency that has not been doing very much under buchanan and his predecessors and turn it into the nerve center of this massive war effort so yeah so there, there's no blueprint there's no uh <coughs> guidance he really has to make up everything he's doing as he goes along. Well, in fact, he's the, he's the first president to use the phrase war powers, correct? Or am I... uh, that may, I don't know that for a fact. Um, certainly he's the, he's the first to invoke them seriously. That's what, yeah, so. Uh, to, to, to use them, you know, he uses it most famously to justify the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. That's, that's purely done under his commander-in-chief power, not under any any other grant that the Constitution gives. Right. So Lincoln, I mean, Lincoln is a lawyer. He knows the Constitution. He knows uh, how to interpret documents and uh, how to bend them if necessary to, to accomplish a larger goal. Um, 
uh, as commander in chief, Lincoln has a whole lot on his plate. He is trying to develop strategy. He's trying to manage generals. Uh, he's got to keep an eye on his armies spread out all over the country. He's got prickly relationships with uh, a couple of foreign countries, uh, Great Britain, Chris, uh, where Chris is now, and uh, France, which could both be uh, either allies or enemies, depending on how things go. And he's trying to figure out how to pay for all this. Uh, and also how, as the war goes on, to keep a very war-weary populace on board with the whole thing. So I wonder where you think Lincoln really shines and where, if anywhere, he falls short uh, as a kind of a military leader as commander-in-chief. Well, I think his strongest attribute there is his ability to learn, his ability to adopt and change uh, ideas and plans as things go. When the war starts, he initially really is acting like uh, like a military commander in some way as you read the official records and you see these notes he's writing saying send this individual regiment from here to there uh, send a gunboat down the Ohio River do this do that in part he's treating it like uh, the politician that he is the, where you dole out patronage he just spends a lot of time in the first weeks of the war appointing people to offices which was how how politics worked at that time you had to have uh, support the spoil system was in full effect and it was not considered corrupt it was considered democratic small d that uh, everyone gets a turn at the public trough and when your party's in you get in nothing you do in government requires any particular training or skills so anyone can can be a postmaster <laughs> and so on uh, and initially the war starts off with that you don't need any particular training or skill apparently to lead a division or a corps and many people who harbor suspicions of West Point uh, will maintain that view all the way through the war. But Lincoln begins uh, acting this way. He's appointing generals with an eye toward politics. He's uh, making these, these really minuscule decisions. But he very quickly learns that that's not how it's going to work, that he can't make all those decisions himself and that he shouldn't. Uh, initially, he occasionally will communicate with officers instead of going to the, the, uh, well, the general in chief when McClellan was appointed or later Halleck. Uh, he'll communicate directly with people and then he'll discover that's not, you can't do that. You've undercut the chain of command when you bypass someone's superior. Uh, and he learns to stop doing that. He learns to delegate uh, and, and to supply the big picture but not to give uh, the, the small-scale instructions that he's doing in 1861 and early 1862. So um, we have a, a, a Rich Randall has a question, and so Lincoln very famously uh, shuffles through a lot of generals before he um, uh, he ends up with Ulysses Grant. Uh, and Rich wants to know: Is Lincoln's lack of experience the reason? Uh, for the time it took the, uh, to put the right leader in place. And as you contemplate that, I would also add on, does, does Lincoln's, the fact that he went through, I mean, he goes through uh, uh, McClellan, uh, uh, Hooker, uh, Burnside, I'm not doing them in the right order, Pope, uh, eventually getting to Grant, does the fact that he uh, does, went through all these people, is that a... a a negative or is it kind of a positive in the light of what you were just saying that he learned as he went along? Well, first the question takes a, a Eastern centric view of the war, which a lot of Civil War writers do. Uh, Lincoln finds the right leadership for the Western theater uh, quite early, that Grant emerges, Sherman emerges. By 1863 you have uh, Thomas and Grant and Sherman holding major commands, and they will continue to do so the rest of the war. So it's only the Army of the Potomac that goes through this long process. The other armies in the West quickly get, relatively quickly, get the leaders they need. And uh, then armies in the East, like the Army of the James, never get quality leadership. So we're, we're really only talking about the Army of the Potomac when we say Lincoln had to go through a long list. I don't think it's inexperience that made it take so long. I don't think uh, 
you know, Jefferson Davis never got over Braxton Bragg. His experience didn't help him select the best <laughs> leaders, uh, certainly in the West, throughout the war. So it's hard to imagine how having more, what kind of experience would call, would, would help you to see through George McCollum, for example. McCollum comes in with all these extraordinary qualifications uh, in terms of experience and education, as well as connections uh, and charisma confidence, a lot of alliteration. He's very good, looks very good, and in some ways is very good. He's able to you know, maneuver the Army of the Potomac from Washington down to the Virginia Peninsula uh, in a matter of weeks without losing uh, a soldier practically. Uh, when we're on our bus tours, I'll point out that I have a hard time getting uh, my you know, family, two kids and the dog in the van for vacation within an hour and a half of the time we plan to leave. Uh, <laughs> and yet, McCollum gets 200,000 people where he wants them to go in you know, a relatively short time. McCollum has great skills. So how would a more experienced leader have seen through that and said, uh, you do everything so well until the moment of battle and I magically predict you won't be good then, so I'm gonna replace you now, even though it's politically devastating to do so. I just don't see how, how a different leader could have made a different set of decisions in, in McCollum's case. There's a, there's a great um, a quote of Lincoln's that I love um, concerning McClellan. He is meeting with Senator Ben Wade, and Ben Wade is just pleading with him to get rid of McClellan. And he says, Lincoln says, well, who do I replace him with? And Wade says, anybody. And Lincoln says, Wade, anybody will do for you but i need somebody, somebody. and exactly. uh, yeah. it's it's hard. it can't it's you know just knowing that the guy isn't doing exactly what you want you also have to wonder oh well if the next guy i try to put in there he may not do it either no and and lincoln tries initially just persuading mcclellan to do what needs to be done the same thing in the west he tries to persuade halleck and buell to cooperate in 1862 in that sense, Lincoln's lack of experience is almost a benefit uh, in that he can see some what appear to us to be obvious big picture issues that the generals have lost sight of because they're so entrenched in their in the, the actual operations of their profession. Uh, with Halleck, for example, uh, along the Mississippi and Buell, coming south from Cincinnati and Louisville in 1862, Lincoln writes to them and says, could you not both act at the same time? That would mean the Confederates couldn't stop both of you. They don't have enough people to do that. And at West Point, they would say, oh, you're talking about interior lines and exterior lines. Lincoln doesn't necessarily know the jargon, but he can just see as a matter of common sense. That is the way to do that. As he will put it later in the war, those not skinning can hold a leg. Everybody can do something, and that's how we'll defeat the enemy. So Lincoln's you know, common sense approach is ultimately turns out to be successful. In late 1861, he writes a sort of document for himself suggesting here are the strategic outlines of the war. We need to go you know, down the Mississippi. We need to do this and do that. And it's not uh, the ideal blueprint necessarily for the whole war but no one else is producing anything on that strategic scale. Well, Jerry, that's, that's, a, thinking. that's actually a question I had. How, how much of what ultimately becomes the Union strategy for victory is, is, a, is a product of Lincoln's thought? Um, is he the person that comes up with this strategy? Because, you know, it's always, the, the old history books are always, it's the Anaconda plan and da da da, but it's a lot more involved than that. So. What becomes the Union strategy? Does that spring from Lincoln, or does that spring from other people? Well, Anna Ella Carroll is the uh, the person some people will tell you came up with it. I thought that was an interesting uh, thing that came across the radar a few years ago. A, a woman who wrote pro-Union uh, pieces and and was a uh, you know, active, a publicist in favor of the Union cause. And at one point she made some strategic suggestions, which pretty much coincide with uh, with what Scott was thinking and what later develops. It's certainly not clear that I, I'm 
don't even want to be be kidding about it to imply that she thought of it and convinced Lincoln what to do. No one ever comes up with a, with a plan uh, that is followed all the way through. There, there's no document in 1861 or 62 that says here's the blueprint for right. the war. Lincoln doesn't uh, propose things. In some cases, people like Grant do things that Lincoln later says, I didn't think that was a good idea. Uh, you know, Lincoln writes that remarkable letter to Grant after the Vicksburg campaign, where he says, you know, you propose to cut off from your supplies and go around. I thought this was a bad idea. You were right, and I was wrong. It just, I find that in some ways the most remarkable sentence in the entire uh, official records written by uh, a commanding officer. Of the entire U.S. government for the entire <laughs> last 250 years. It, it may be, exactly. To, to, for a superior to say to his subordinate, you were right and I was wrong. No, I'm sorry if you were offended. No blaming anyone else, no mealy-mouthed, no pre shifting the blame, no throwing anyone else under the bus. You were right. I was wrong. You have to be extraordinarily strong in character to have the confidence to say something like that. And Lincoln had that. Uh, there's a there's another moment uh, too. Well, well, you, maybe this is a little bit further down the line uh, because it deals with General Grant. So I'll hold that moment. But Lincoln, uh, there's several different times where his 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 um, I won't say it's humility. I will think. I think you're absolutely right. His his supreme confidence uh, in himself. Uh, comes through in some very, very interesting, uh, some very interesting ways. Um, I want to remind everybody we're here on History Happy Hour with uh, Jerry Prokopovich, who is the uh, host of the podcast Civil War Talk Radio, uh, and is an expert on all things um, civil and all things war. Okay, <laughs> I hope that's uh, that's pretty accurate there. That's a big. <laughs> Yeah, um, we'll keep it civil here, and so we'll all be experts at that. Um, Sounds good. In in uh, the you mentioned the Emancipation Proclamation earlier, and Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation under his war powers. It's probably you know we hear a lot about executive orders. This is probably the most famous executive order ever issued from the White House, um, and he says it is strictly a military measure. And I wonder if we look at it as a military measure, um, what was its military purpose? And then perhaps more importantly, what was its military and diplomatic impact? Well, the purpose was to resolve the, the question of what would become of the, the refugees from slavery. You had, from the start of the war, from the time the first three men show up at Fortress Monroe and knock on the door and ask for sanctuary, and Benjamin Butler says, all right, you're contraband of war, you can come in. Uh, from that moment on, every time the American flag moves further into southern territory, uh, enslaved people flock to it, they're seeking sanctuary, they're seeking freedom. They're, they know intuitively that this army that has arrived is their army of liberation, even though that's expressly not federal policy, not congressional policy, not Lincoln's policy at the start of the war. None of those matter. Uh, the enslaved people can see more clearly that this army is going to result in freedom. And over time, Lincoln comes to that recognition. In the summer of 1862, when he interviews, uh, he, he invites uh, Kentucky slaveholders into the White House to urge them to accept his proposal for compensated emancipation. And he tells them the, the mere friction and abrasion of war is going to destroy your institution. You're much better off if you'll take our federal dollars now. Let us pay you uh, to emancipate these people than to try to hold on to them. So Lincoln sees that, that the, the, the institution's wearing away. Mm -hmm. But what do you do with these freed people? Who, who do they belong to now? The idea that they belong to themselves is radical in the extreme. The Dred Scott decision is still theoretically in effect, as is the fugitive slave law from 1850. So in theory, they're supposed to be returned to their, their so-called owners who are busy fighting a war against the government. So that's not practical. So does the government own them now? Does anyone own them? What to do? By declaring 
slavery by declaring these individuals free. Lincoln does not end slavery. He says that these individuals are henceforward and forever free. That, first of all, at a stroke, clarifies their status. They are, in fact, free. And it also clarifies the status of those still held in slavery, which many people, uh, I think, mistakenly argue are, are not freed by the proclamation. They are freed by the proclamation. It doesn't take legal effect yet. It doesn't take practical effect, but it takes legal effect that moment. If I drive 80 miles an hour down a residential street, uh, I'm breaking the law whether I get stopped for speeding or not. If I'm holding people in against their will after January 1, 1863, I'm holding free people illegally, even if the army hasn't showed up to enforce that yet. So they are free, technically. Um, it means that the Union can begin recruiting uh, black soldiers on a large scale for the first time. What Frederick Douglass said, uh, uh, we've been fighting the, the Confederacy with the soft white hand while the hard black hand remains chained behind our back. Uh, no more after 1863. Three, January 1. So you've got a change there, and you've got a denial of that same uh, personnel to the Confederacy. In uh, it was a Glenn David Brasher's excellent book on the, the Peninsula Campaign. He talks about how the Union soldiers observed black workers being forced to dig trenches for the Confederates. And it occurs to Union soldiers and I certainly found this in the research I did on the Army of the Ohio, that wouldn't it be better if these people were on our side? They'd rather be on our side. They can dig trenches for us. They can stop bullets for us. Uh, let's take advantage of this. So the proclamation does that. The last thing you asked about was di diplomacy. And this is very much a side effect. There's no evidence that I've read that Lincoln thought about this or said anything about it at all that by declaring emancipation, it would limit the ability of England and France to recognize the Confederacy. It does have that practical effect. It does put the Confederacy really beyond the pale of Western nations uh, when Lincoln puts slavery on the table as a war aim with the proclamation. But that's not what he was going for, as far as I can tell. But Jerry, in, in terms of kind of the international impact of all of this. I mean, living as I do over here in London, um, I'm very curious. I know that there was a lot of support in England for the Confederacy, and the Confederacy relied very heavily on Great Britain. Um, but there was also, uh, you know, working class people in, in the Midlands and up north were very pro-Union and anti-slave state. Um, but Canada is a British possession at that point. There is some discussion about are we going to get involved? What does Lincoln do, if anything, to actually deal with keeping the rest of the world out of basically our street fight? Well, that that's a, a primary concern of his from start. You're absolutely right, and he, uh, you know, you see this in the, uh, uh, the the crisis, the Trent Affair at Christmas in 1861, when the Union naval captain seizes Confederate diplomats uh, from a ship heading to England. And Seward proposes, well, why don't we actually strike up a war with England? Then the South will unite with us because everybody hates England, and uh, that'll that'll simplify things. And Lincoln, you know, uh, <laughs> replies with great calmness, one war at a time. <laughs> uh, so they they write a very uh, uh, you know conciliatory note to the British government, and and keep that from springing into uh, a, a war. No, Lincoln is very concerned to keep Britain out of the war and to keep Britain from building uh, blockade runners and, and warships for the Confederacy. So it's, uh, it is always on his mind. There's no question about that. I, I don't know that, it, I suppose it's hard to imagine that he didn't think of the effect emancipation would have on English thought. But many of those who supported, in, in Britain, who supported going in on the Confederacy side are not, I, I wouldn't say they're sympathetic to slavery, but they're not unsympathetic. They, they, it doesn't keep them uh, away so much. Um, we had a question about the Emancipation Proclamation, so we'll go back to that. Uh, 
Uh, did it uh, extend to all the states or only those in rebellion? It, it very much was limited to only those in rebellion as of January 1, 1863. You remember that Lincoln announced it in the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam, which was September 17, 62, and five days later on the 22nd, Lincoln announces the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, in which he says 100 days from now, which will be January 1, Here's what's going to happen. Here's what will take effect. And one of the provisions is on that day, all states then in rebellion, or all people living in states then in rebellion will be henceforward and forever free. So it gives the Confederate states one last chance to recant. If they really want to keep the institution of slavery, they can do so if they rejoin the Union. Lincoln is hoping maybe to peel off a state from the Confederacy. Uh, the concern that, well, then slavery would last. Lincoln's already told the Kentuckians who are in the Union, war is wearing away the institution. It's not going to survive the war regardless. So that's not so much the concern. But it can only affect the states in rebellion because that's all the power Lincoln has. He very clear, clearly specifies that the proclamation will apply to the states in rebellion and when it's actually issued on January 1, it limits itself to the uh, counties and parishes in Virginia and Louisiana that have not yet been occupied by federal forces. Because Lincoln's argument is, I'm doing this as a war measure under my commander-in-chief power. And that power doesn't extend into the north. I'm not a war with Delaware, I'm not a war with Kentucky. So I cannot free the slaves in those states. I can only do it to help defeat the rebellion where it exists. So that's why it's limited just, not only just to the states, but just to the actual subsections of states where the oh. rebellion is active on January 1. Although, interestingly, um, you know, it, it, and people pointed that out at the time, as they have ever since, but the psychological impact or the, uh, maybe that's not the right word, the emotional impact, the general public impact of it is far greater than that limited um, than the limited nature of the actual proclamation. Oh, it absolutely is. And Lincoln w was clearly aware of that. It, I'll sometimes ask students to recite the opening of the Emancipation Proclamation, which none of them can do, which actually nobody can do. And then I'll say, well, in that case, here's a copy. Read the first sentence. And they start reading. After about a minute, they're still on the first sentence, which goes on and on and on. Uh, it's a document that uh, Karl Marx wrote at the time. It sounds like the kind of document one pettifogging lawyer sends to another. Um, the, uh, was it Richard Hofstadter said it reads like a bill of lading. It's a technical, legalistic, lawyerly document, partly because Lincoln was very concerned that it not be overturned by the Supreme Court, that it fall within the commander-in-chief power and nothing else, but also because it was so revolutionary in its impact. What you just said, Rick, people recognized this is dynamite. This is the blow at the heart of the slave power such as never been struck before and from which it can never possibly recover unless somehow the South wins the war. This is utterly revolutionary. And Lincoln knows the last thing he needs to do is pour fuel on the fire. He doesn't need, he's not worried about abolitionists supporting it. They're going to support it. You know, Frederick Douglass says, we shout with joy that we live to record this righteous decree. And a year earlier, Douglass is Lincoln's harshest critic because Lincoln's not going fast enough. So Lincoln's got no problem. He knows Douglass and uh, you know, Garrison and the others are going to love this. He's got to bring aboard the people who don't care a whit about slavery in the North. And that's a lot of... Mm -hmm. European Americans, if not the majority. They didn't go into the war to end slavery, and they're not overly interested in it, and he's got to get them on board. So if he writes a big hallelujah day of jubilee is here document, they're not going to appreciate that. So he makes it as narrow as he can. The impact will take care of itself. Um. So, Chris, I was I was kind of leaving a space there for you if you. If oh you no, I'm one. sorry. I just saw we got a bunch more questions, so I wanted to. Yeah, give so you, you want to bring one in? Why don't you bring sure. one in? 
Um, why don't we? Uh, I know Eileen's uh, Redding has asked a really interesting question, um, and she'd like to know if you could contrast the military management styles of Lincoln versus his opponent Davis. I think that that's an excellent question. James McPherson has gone so far as to suggest that if Lincoln led the Confederacy and Davis the Union, we might be two countries today. Uh, and that has wow. a lot to do with their military management style. Lincoln did go through a lot of generals, but he was willing to sack those who were not doing what they needed to do. And I've already brought up the example of Braxton Bragg. He's Davis's friend, Davis's friend, so he never, never gets the ax. Uh, Lincoln did not fancy himself a military expert for all the reasons we talked about a minute ago, the lack of experience. So he doesn't imagine that he knows better than the generals, even though in fact it's, there are many cases where he does. Uh, Davis, on the other hand, is willing to get involved in minutia. He's not willing, however, to force Robert E. Lee to become a strategic commander governing all of Southern strategy. He keeps that for himself to the extent anyone does it. And really the result, therefore, is no one does. There's, there's no overall strategy uh, combining the efforts in both theaters through most of the war. Lincoln is popular with his troops. He does things like uh, every, every Friday or every other Friday, he would go over all the, uh, the death penalty cases, all the soldiers scheduled to be executed for falling asleep on guard duty, which is a very, very dangerous offense when you're at war and could lead to the death of thousands of men uh, if your army is surprised. But Lincoln would go through and, and pardon as many of them as he possibly could, uh, leaving in, in the, the penalties in place only when he really couldn't. Now, on the one hand, this cuts against what I just said, Lincoln paying attention to detail. But the result was he was, it helped him be seen by his troops as someone who understood the situation they were in, uh, who related to them. He was not popular with his generals for doing that. People like Sherman said, how can we have discipline if we can't carry out these executions? Lincoln was not only physically seen by the troops, he was seen by everyone. He got himself photographed throughout the war. There's over 100 photographs of Abraham Lincoln uh, extant. There are how many wartime photographs of Jefferson Davis? I think maybe two. Uh, people, you can show any child a picture of a man with a beard and a tall hat, and they will go, oh, that's Abraham Lincoln. Uh, nobody knows, outside of the people watching this today, what Jefferson Davis looked like. Davis didn't worry about that. He didn't attempt to make himself popular. So in all kinds of dimensions, Lincoln's management was, was clearly more successful than Davis's. Um, you mentioned that uh, Lincoln was uh, pretty popular with the soldiers, not so popular, that particular move, not popular with the generals. I was going to ask about his overall popularity and ask if it was really different among the officers, uh, not just generals, but the entire officer rank. Um, I mean, there were times in the war when there uh, were supposedly plots or talks of plots against uh, Lincoln that uh, people who wanted to put McClellan in as a, a dictator. Uh, and there was a fair amount of machinations at various points. Uh, was there a difference in how the officers in the Union Army felt about Lincoln compared to how the private soldiers in the Army felt about him? Yes, there, there's an excellent new book uh, by Zachary Fry called uh, A Republic in the Ranks. And it's about the election of 1864, uh, or partly about the election of 1864, when soldiers voted, which was a new thing in American history. But it, it really looks at politics in the Army of the Potomac throughout the war. And he, he shows that America was then, as it is now, an extraordinarily political nation. People are deeply committed to their political views and the people they favor and don't favor. And that was true, uh, possibly even more so in the 1860s. Certainly the voting the percentage of eligible voters who turned out was, was much higher than it uh, was in the late 20th, 21st centuries. 
So when you joined the army, you didn't stop being a Democrat or a Republican. Even if you were, uh, whether you were a captain or major or a general, uh, you were still politically motivated. So yes, you, you had whole subunits, whole divisions, even whole corps that had a reputation for leaning more toward Lincoln and the Republicans or more toward McClellan and the Democrats. Uh, wow. And this goes on all the way through the war. Uh, it doesn't end when McClellan leaves. There's an attempt to take up a collection to buy a gift for McClellan in 1864 that, that uh, Zach Fry describes. It's just fascinating uh, how the, the success or lack of this attempt to take up a collection in which officers were supposed to tell their soldiers how much they had to donate to the <laughs> collection. Um, it runs afoul of the fact that the junior officer corps has by this time moved strongly toward Lincoln and are proselytizing their soldiers to vote Republican in the 1864 election, uh, which the majority of them do. And uh, yet, just to add one more wrinkle, Jonathan White's book on the 1864 election points out, while the soldiers voted overwhelmingly for Lincoln, that didn't mean they stopped being Democrats and became Republicans. They didn't join Lincoln's party. They opposed the Democrats' platform that called the war a failure. They were not going to vote themselves to be losers. They were going to win the war, and Lincoln was the man who was going to do it, and they were going to vote for him. But they don't give up their loyalty to their original party in the most in most cases, White argues, and it's a uh, just fascinating uh, argument there as well. So yes, politics continues all the way through the war. Lincoln does become popular ideologically with a lot of the junior officer corps, and for his support of the war, the soldiers are going to go down with him they're, they're not going to vote themselves uh, into into armistice or surrender and vote for McClellan well but it was famously said that the Democrats had nominated a war candidate on a peace platform with McClellan and he, he here he was a guy who as a general so you'd think he'd be popular with the army but he's saddled with this platform that they're going to hate but I, I want to ask you about the 1864 election and, and you you brought that up. It's really pretty interesting. I think 78% of Union soldiers voted for Lincoln. Um, but I think it's White, whose book you mentioned, who suggests that that there may have been, an, uh, there might have been a thumb on the scale a little bit, that there might have been some uh, intimidation of, uh, of voters uh, because the voting is pretty public. They're going to get a ticket uh, and have to send that ticket in. Um, so I wonder, you know, your thoughts on that. I, I saw a skeptical eyebrow raise, so fair enough, and you can you can come back with that. But also that is, uh, and and um, without getting into anything going on today, they they are hundreds of thousands of soldiers who are, of course, voting by mail from uh, their uh, their camps where they are. So that's a kind of an interesting thought in the debates that we're having about that same subject today. Well. Let me put this on the table before going further. You mentioning the contemporary situation. In 1864, the, the election uh, was going to take place in a time of unprecedented national crisis. We've never faced anything like it before or since. Uh, every four years, people say, this is the most important election of my lifetime. And then four years later, this was the most important election of my lifetime. 1864, the country was in two halves. and. 800,000 men, 750,000 men are dying over it. That's a crisis. Nothing like it before or since. And in the midst of that incredible national crisis, when it was proposed to Lincoln, maybe you should postpone the election, he replied, absolutely not, under no circumstances. The whole point of the, the war is to vindicate that a people's government can survive, that people are qualified to govern themselves there was nothing wrong with the 1860 election and no one ever alleged there was. No no Confederate ever said it was rigged. They simply didn't like the outcome. And therefore they were going to tear apart the federal government and create their own country. And Lincoln's response was no, you, you abide by the election results, win or lose. That's how the game is played. If you don't like it, you try again next year. But if we were to cancel 1864, we would be giving up the principle for which we're fighting. 
So he went ahead with the election, even though he was certain in August of 64 that he was going to lose. He wrote the famous blind memorandum uh, for his cabinet to sign without reading, in which he laid out what his policy would be between the time he lost the election in November, as he expected, and the time his successor was inaugurated in March of 1865, in which he was going to try to win the war at all cost, because he said, my successor will be elected on a platform under which he cannot possibly do so. So I just want to get that on the table. There is no excuse ever to delay or cancel an election. If there wasn't in 64, then there, there can't be one. Uh, now, as to the voters, uh, Jonathan White's point is correct. There, there was thumb on the scale. There, there were pressures. One thing people are not always aware of is that elections in the 1860s, in the, in the 19th century generally, did not have secret ballots. That was considered an avenue for corruption. The idea of voting was that everybody was political all the time. You went to uh, speeches, you went to your party's conventions, you heard your favorite speaker talk. If you went to the other guy talking, you heckled him during the speech the way people did at Lincoln and Stephen Douglas in their debates. So everybody knows where everybody else in the community stands. There's no question who's a Republican or who's a Democrat and who's a Whig. And then after the Whigs are gone, who's a Republican? So when it's time to vote, everyone knows how you're going to vote. There's no secret. Now, if you had a secret ballot, then you could sell your vote. You could talk Democrat all day long and then get paid off by some Republican and secretly vote uh, and betray your party. So to avoid corruption, we have the open, honest, public ballot. And that was how voting was done uh, well into Reconstruction years. Now, the flip side of that, if everybody knows how you're going to vote, if there's a majority in the community that doesn't want you to vote or doesn't want you to vote a certain way, and they can see how you're voting, then you have the things that start to happen in the Reconstruction South. African-Americans start to vote after the 15th Amendment, and they're told by the, the, the white majority who they must vote for. And if they publicly vote for the wrong guy, for the Republican, uh, the consequences are severe. And that leads to the adoption of what was called the Australian ballot, what we call the secret ballot. Uh, but that's a reform of the well after the Civil War years. So you're absolutely right. Civil War soldiers in the North are voting publicly and openly in front of their peers. And if you're, if you're ashamed of your vote, you, know, you should have nothing to hide, was, was the feeling. That does, however, mean that peer pressure will operate. If you're the only McClellan person in your company, it can be pretty awkward. Uh, and that does affect things. The government also puts the thumb on the scale a little bit in that some states did not allow their soldiers to vote uh, in any form other than in person at the ballot box. So if you dodged the draft and stayed home, you can vote. But if you picked up a gun and fought for your country, you could not vote. Now, the obvious nonsense of that was clear to many people, and many states changed the laws so that soldiers could vote. But some states where they couldn't, uh, Lincoln asked his generals, he wrote to Sherman and said, could you conceivably furlough a couple regiments to, say, Indiana, uh, knowing that the soldiers would vote for, for the Republicans, uh, would vote for Lincoln? Could you furlough them around Election Day so they could be home and cast their ballots in their hometowns? And some of that did happen. So it's not illegitimate, necessarily, to allow soldiers to vote by sending them home. But the states from which those regiments were chosen were ones where the election was closed and Lincoln could use those soldier votes. So, um, Rick, do you want to ask Phil's question, or should I jump in here? Or? Yeah, jump in and ask it. Well, I, I want this kind of goes with it. Um, Phil has asked... Um, what was Lincoln's feeling towards Grant's view in the war, which seemed to be use the tools I've given you to their fullest extent. Um, and, and to that, I kind of wanted to tack on, by the time Grant comes into his own, um, the war is a lot different than it was in 1862 and 1863. The violence, the, the casualties, the way the war is fought um, has changed. Um, I know Charles Royster talks about how wars become more and more violent as it goes along. Um, and uh, 
uh, Dr. McPherson talks about Lincoln uh, adopting a hard war policy. And I'd like to know a little bit more about kind of how the war evolves and whether Lincoln is kind of just dragged along or does he embrace these changes in how the war is being fought? Um, and why is the war in 1864 different than it is in, say, 61, 62? Well, well it, I mean, wars, wars do evolve, don't they? That, that any war looks different at the end than it did at the start. Clausewitz says, you know, the war has a logic of its own, its own dynamic, and, and you can't control how a war is going to end. You can maybe control how you start it, but no one can control where it's going to go and how it's going to end. I wouldn't say Lincoln embraces the additional uh, violence of it, but he's willing to face it. He, he says to, uh, it, there, there's one cited source for this conversation, uh, that after Fredericksburg and the, the most one-sided defeat the Army of the Potomac suffers in terms of casualties, Lincoln says the Army of the Potomac, says we could fight a week of Fredericksburgs. We could fight one every day for a week. And when it would be over, the Army of the Potomac would still be a mighty host, and Lee's army would be decimated. And then he says, I cannot find a general who can face the awful arithmetic. So Lincoln understood that the North did have superior numbers, and if they were willing to simply press, as Grant obviously was, that they could eventually have that success. And Lincoln urged Grant to do that. He famously tells him to chew and choke uh, at, at the Confederates. Don't, don't, you know, with a bulldog grip, never let go. Keep, keep wearing them down. Lincoln is not afraid to face the increasing harshness of war. When the Confederacy announces that Union soldiers who are of African descent are captured, they will be treated as escaped slaves and their white officers will be treated as people attempting to foment a slave rebellion, which means they'll be executed. Lincoln has no hesitation in responding to the Confederacy in that case. We, for every one of our soldiers enslaved, we will take one of yours and put them to hard labor on the public works. And for every one of our officers you execute, we will execute one of yours. So Lincoln's not afraid to face the increasing harshness of the war as it develops, but he never encourages it. He doesn't, uh, his weapons are words. Right. And look at how he uses words in the war. You, know, you read the Gettysburg Address and it has this remarkable effect of helping to redefine what the war is about and to give the North confidence that the awful sacrifices they're making are worthwhile and that this is going to have a, a great end that this is going to preserve government of by and for the people this will bring about a new birth of freedom nowhere in there does he mention and we're kicking the asses of our enemies nowhere does he say anything negative about the people fighting on the other side you can read the document if you read it out of context it's not even clear he's only talking about union soldiers when he talks about they who fought here gave the last full measure of devotion. He is he never stirs up hatred for the Confederacy. He he one of his legal colleagues once said of him, Lincoln was not a good hater. Uh, that was not what he did. And his last you know, major speech, the second inaugural, he promises malice toward none, you know, charity for all. So while the war is getting harsher continuously, Lincoln is not making it so on purpose and he's using words that will help bring it back as soon as possible when the war is over back to Americans sharing their common national identity uh, the idea he flirted with the idea of, of taking the field I mentioned uh, earlier after uh, uh, after Gettysburg at one point he says if I'd gone up there, I could have whipped them myself, referring to Meade's failure to pursue Lee after after uh, July 3rd, 1863. Meade pursues, but cautiously, carefully. And, and Lincoln at one point says out loud, if I'd gone up there, I, I could have done better. I could have whipped them myself. I could have 
ended the war. But he knows that's not true. He never says that publicly. He never chastises Meade for failing to do it. He writes a letter that does it, but then he files the letter away, never mails it. He did not have that look in the eye that we see in the photos of Stonewall Jackson or Grant or Sherman or Lee. Mm -hmm. He was not a killer. Those men who led those huge armies and sent thousands to their deaths, they were stone-cold killers, whatever else they were. And Lincoln was not, and he knew he was not. Jerry, one one last question here her for you. We're we're starting to run out of time. Um, probably our two greatest wartime presidents are Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt. And I wonder how you would compare them. So, no love here for James Polk or. Uh... <laughs> trying to think of the, the worst wartime president. Well, um, yeah, I mean, Woodrow Wilson, James Wilson. Polk, uh, <laughs> um, George Depending Washington small the war. wasn't president. <laughs> we could. Well, well, I, Washington I had could, the Northwest Indian War. but I, I'm just going to throw yeah. in here, though, uh, one of my favorite historians, John Keegan, says that the wartime leader that he makes the closest comparison to is Winston Churchill, so I'll just throw Churchill So it's a three for Churchill, FDR, and Lincoln, compare and contrast. We'll be back in an hour when you're done. <laughs> Everybody, you know, refill your glasses. <laughs> no, you don't have to talk about Churchill. Yeah, we have 10 no. seconds left. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the, uh, it, well, one thing, the, the facility with words, Lincoln's ability to rally the nation with words, to speak to people on a level they understood as... Roosevelt did initially in his fireside chats, as he continued to do, to, to make the analogies of lend-lease to lending your neighbor a garden hose when his house is on fire. You don't, you know, ask for what the terms are. You know, put out the fire, and we'll talk about it later. That's a kind of analogy that every listener could understand. Lincoln spoke that way in terms that every listener could read and understand. Um, Churchill, you know, had perhaps more high-flown rhetoric at times. But again, he said things that people clearly understood that, that were, uh, you know, cut through the, the verbiage. They had that in common. Uh, they had an unquenchable will to victory in common. But they had very different styles, certainly. If, if Lincoln was occasionally moving, you know, a, a regiment here or there in 1861, Churchill never stopped tinkering with... Uh, a new scheme with a new plan, a new tool, a new gadget, a new stratagem. He was always getting deep into the weeds and things, uh, often with negative effect. Whereas I would argue Roosevelt is even farther in the other direction. He, he does not pretend to manage in that way. He lets others manage. He lets others come to consensus and you know, he steers the consensus, but he, he does not attempt to govern in that fashion. Um, my favorite, perhaps only Roosevelt story, is the one where he, he's, uh, you know, Averill Harriman comes in and gives him this impassioned 10-minute speech on why they need to do a certain policy, and he says, Averill, you're absolutely right, and he leaves. And then a minute later, Harry Hopkins comes in and gives him a 10-minute speech on why they need to do exactly the opposite. <laughs> and he listens and goes, Harry, you're absolutely right. And Eleanor has been in the room the whole time. He says, you know, Franklin, you know, you just said to Averill Harriman he's right, and you just told Harry Hopkins the exact opposite. He says, Eleanor, you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a different style of leadership than Lincoln, um, but it got the job done. Uh, he he he. Lincoln and Roosevelt both acquired the best people around them to get things done. Lincoln's cabinet that Doris Kearns Goodwin has famously written about, the team of rivals, all these people who were so uh, you know, talented, even though they often disagreed with Lincoln, they were literally his rivals for the presidency and often from the other party, didn't matter. He picked the best people. He wasn't afraid of them. He had that confidence we mentioned earlier. He had to, to keep his enemies, he said, where I can keep an eye on them. 
and and Roosevelt likewise, uh, you know, kept Marshall in Washington because that was the best person. You could have people and and you know, send Eisenhower come up with all kinds of great plans, create a ghost army in England. Uh, oh, um, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Well <laughs> done. Well done. <laughs> We're getting concerned. You, you could do those things. Uh, Get the bonus points. So. <laughs> but he allowed, uh, you know, he allowed Eisenhower to fight his war, MacArthur to, to, to fight his war, and, and, you know, to coordinate them at the highest levels of King and Marshall, but, but did not attempt to steer them in ways that, uh, uh, that Lincoln had to. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for joining Thanks, us Jerry. today. This has been fabulous, and I uh, especially enjoyed our discussion about the 1864 election. Didn't know we were going there, but that was great fun and really, really interesting. And well, Thank uh, you for having me. Uh, let me mention that uh, Jerry Prokopovich, okay, I think I got it there. There we go, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah woo, 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 uh, is um, uh, the host of uh, Civil War Talk Radio and the author of Did Lincoln Own Slaves? and other frequently asked questions about Abraham Lincoln. And he also is a fabulous tour guide for Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. So yes, it's an inside job, folks. And Jerry, we're delighted you joined us. We're going to drop you out here. Stick around and we'll chat with you a little bit after the show. Okay, right. but Thanks, thank guys. you so much. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, we are running a little long, Chris, but I think we That's still right. have time to get in a history happened here. Okay. And uh, I'm going to let you go first because you sent me some lovely uh, photographs I relating did. to uh, Abraham Lincoln in London. So yes. tell me about this. Uh, it's, uh, on the left is a wonderful statue of Abraham Lincoln. Um, and uh, if you were to stand at Lincoln's shoulder and look to where he is looking to, uh, he is gazing upon the Houses of Parliament. So if you are ever in uh, London and go to Parliament Square, you can see Lincoln keeping an eye on Parliament. So I thought yeah. that was interesting. Now, now Chris, I want uh, to... I, I really... Tell us that little-known story about Lincoln and his trip to London, because I think a lot of people don't know about that. Oh, he went up on the eye. Yeah, because... Because he was never in London, and I but, live but in... But his spirit is there. I live in Illinois. You live in the whole state. Land of Lincoln. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, so great. I'm, dude, I'm delighted you sent me some stuff from London. But <laughs> but uh, stuff happens here, man. And Did so I, I went out... Like on, what? I went out... What? What? <laughs> you're a tough guy now. And you're dressed like it's November, by the it way. It feels so, like it, yeah, by the way. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, I went out and found at the corner of Lake Street and Wacker Drive in uh, Chicago the site of the wigwam. And that's ah. my bike there. I just want to point out I did not you know, pull this picture off the internet. How do I know I that's your bike? Went there. <laughs> Thank you. How do I? Look, at, look at how ratty it is. Uh, uh, it, it's a city bike. It's a bike that, that, that uh, anybody, nobody would bother stealing. Uh, but the wigwam is where Abraham Lincoln was nominated for president in 1860 and it was a big building built expressly for that occasion it was there for I don't know how long before it was torn down and there's big office buildings there now mm -hmm. but also interesting is that that same site before the wigwam just to mention this mm -hmm. was the Saugenash Hotel built in 1831 which this is my favorite thing about the Saugenash Hotel it was the 12th building built in Chicago okay can we just go back to like that picture with your bike Okay, I'm oh, sorry. We're off the Saganash Hotel and we're back on the bike. Yeah, okay. I just want to ask the guests, would you rather look at the Houses of Parliament or Rick's oh, bike? Oh, it's I on. <laughs> it's on. Now, but if that's your question, then I have to say to the guests, so are we, are we appreciating more Lincoln in London, where he never visited, or Lincoln in the state that he had his Left. virtual entire Left. career in? Left. And the site where he was nominated for president. Ladies and gentlemen, you can vote now and uh, just be careful because this is a public ballot. This is not the Australian ballot oh, okay. from, from, the, from the empire. We're not going in that direction. So anyway, it was the, also the site of the Saugadash Hotel, 12th building built in Chicago, and the other 11 were like, the owners were like jealous, like, oh my God, the, number 12, and they really hit it. Uh, so... 
Uh, next week on uh, History Happy Hour, we're going to have a very special History Happy Hour because we're going to talk, and we're actually, I think Chris is going to do a lot of the talking, a, a rare a rare experience rare here, indeed. Uh, about uh, Lieutenant Dick Winters, who was, of course, the commander of Easy Company in the Band of Brothers, and Chris, somebody that you knew personally really, really well. Yeah, I just, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my friendship with Major Winters and uh, maybe answer some of the questions people might have now about him uh, and about, you know, that they've had reading about him over the year. Um, I thought it was time to share some personal stories and maybe help uh, enlighten people about somebody who I was very close to. So I think that'll be a very special show, and we hope you will join us. So thanks again for being with us on History Happy Hour. Thanks, folks. Be safe. <laughs>